I'm going to talk about a submarine that actually came ashore here in Albuquerque about <laughs> one mile southeast of where you're sitting right now, which is amazing. It was a Japanese midget submarine that was captured uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. Oh, I need the remote. <clears throat> Pretty soon I'm going to have my hands full. <laughs> Multiple. Okay, this was a, a very small submarine, two-man submarine, and as you saw in the title slide, it arrived uh, outside of Pearl Harbor, piggybacked onto its mothership, another submarine. So there were actually five midget submarines, all piggybacked onto uh, these five stationed out here on December 6, 1941. <clears throat> Am I getting in the way of the projection? No, you're, you're fine. fine. <laughs> um, so, on board, HA-19, I'm going to use that. That was the designation for this particular submarine. Uh, it was attached to I-24 right here, so it was sitting right there. About 11 o'clock at night, it was a moonlit night. Uh, she detached and uh, started uh, to make us approach into Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> this is the officer in charge. This was the captain, and his name was Sakamaki. And his crew was a petty officer, Inagaki. Now, it was just the two of them on board. A little bit more about the submarine. It, uh, it had two forward torpedoes, uh, muzzle loaded. It had a battery here and a battery here. There was no engine, no gasoline or diesel engine. This was strictly an electric submarine. And uh, this is the control room here. Uh, right here, there was a hatch very, very top of the conning tower, 16 inch diameter. So this is the motor here. On board also was a 300 pound scuttling charge. This was a suicide mission. The idea was to maximize damage to our aircraft carriers, which fortunately were all at sea, battleships and cruisers in Pearl Harbor. And uh, that was going to occur in between the two aerial assaults by the Japanese. Uh, here's a real good rendition of what it looked like, uh, and the torpedo it carried uh, was uh, kind of short range, three to four miles, and uh, could go 51 miles an hour. The submarine itself uh, could travel on the surface about 26 miles per hour, a little less than that submerged. It had a very short range, only 100 nautical miles, and it could only go 100 feet. Uh, this was designed really for uh, attacking coastal regions and going into harbors. Um, but things did not go very well. <laughs> HA-19 ran aground. It was shelled by two, uh, two destroyers, uh, also um, depth charged. The crew were overcome by battery fumes and, well, it just drifted around the coast. It never did make it into Pearl Harbor. Uh, scuttling efforts failed, and actually Inagaki drowned in the surf. Sakamaki uh, made it to shore. He and his submarine were captured on December 8th, 1941. I'll show you where this took place. This is Oahu. Um, you've all probably been there. This is Pearl Harbor. She was parked out here, ran aground on a coral reef. So when it got in trouble, and there were four other submarines, a couple of them did make it in, but they didn't do any damage. Uh, it drifted around, this is about a 20 mile path along the coast, the east coast, or the south coast of Oahu, uh, past Diamond Head, past Cocoa Head, over here to Waimanalo, and that's where she ran aground again on a coral reef. Just a little north of Waimanalo was an army base, Bellows Field, and there were sentries there, and this little painting shows Navy and Army with their rifles pointed at 
uh, Sakamaki. And by the way, he became the very first prisoner of war in the Pacific Theater. Well, the submarine was a war prize, and it was salvaged uh, after it was captured, salvaged, and then shipped to the mainland on a freighter. It was shipped to Mare Island Naval Shipyard. I was stationed there during the submarine force. Don't ask me all about Navy, only submarine Navy. <laughs> the whole time I was in the Navy, I was on submarines. Anyway, at Mare Island, I went to nuclear power school there. It's in Vallejo, California, uh, on the upper part of uh, San Francisco Bay. <coughs> and what, what went on here is they modified the submarine so that it could be used in parades and exhibits as part of the War Savings Bond program run by the Treasury Department. Uh, so it went through some heavy modifications. Here, here it is on a rail car uh, at, still at Mare Island. And some of the modifications included, now there's a port and starboard side, so on both sides the, there's a little stairs and a catwalk that was fold down on both sides of the submarine and 22 windows were cut in total uh, on port and starboard sides so that people could go up these stairs, walk along the catwalk, look through the windows and look inside. It was uh, on a uh, uh, 90, uh, actually the total length of the submarine and the hauling truck was 91 feet. Um, the nationwide tour actually started in San Francisco on uh, Navy Day. The original Navy Day was October 27th, and that's the birthday of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a big supporter of the Navy and the Navy League. So, this year marks the 75th anniversary of the war bonds campaign. The Treasury Department was really encouraging Americans to buy war bonds and war savings stamps. And uh, after 120 visits in California and Arizona, it finally moved into New Mexico. And I'm going to show you exactly where it went in New Mexico, because that's the main part of this talk. But a little bit about war bonds. They came in denominations of $25 to all the way up to $10,000 and uh, had a 10-year maturity and a 2.9 uh, rate of return. So here is the route through New Mexico. It didn't go to Santa Fe, which I'm surprised about, but it came in on Highway 80 and uh, went to Lordsburg first, then Deming, Las Cruces, and over a weekend, it went down to Fort Bliss and El Paso. Then it came back up, running up the Rio Grande Valley, stopping in Hatch, uh, Hot Springs, which is now TRC, uh, Socorro, and Berlin, and finally Albuquerque, and then through to Harris Canyon, to Moriarty, and Moriarty at the time was known as Buford. Uh, Moriarty has kind of consumed Buford, so uh, that's why I put Buford here, though. Okay, uh, then it took uh, 285 going on down the Pecos River Valley to Roswell, Artesia, and Carlsbad, and finally entered Texas on its way to Pecos. So, this is kind of interesting. Here it is. Uh, that, this submarine is not, this picture is not in Lordsburg, but Lordsburg uh, greeted the submarine with an honor guard and 600 school children and raised $1,900. And then uh, it went to Deming and raised another 2500 And Governor John Dempsey supplied a uh, uh, New Mexico State Police escort throughout this uh, route that you saw on my map. This submarine you see is turned on its side. I'll explain that a couple times here, but uh, the worry was getting under underpasses, uh, mm -hmm. and including one right here in Albuquerque. Uh, so it was able to be rotated on its longitudinal axis, and uh, then it had enough clearance to get underneath some bridges. This is kind of a sidebar, but it's kind of interesting because Lordsburg, during the Second World War, was a Japanese-American internment camp. And this is an artist's rendering of it. It later became a, a POW camp for 
uh, Italians and Germans, and the Japanese Americans were relocated up to Santa Fe internment camp. But what's ironic about it is that uh, Sakamaki submarine went right by uh, the Japanese internment. Now, I don't think he ever made it there himself. Uh, we're still researching that. I think that's probably true. He didn't get there. But we were joking that, you know, wouldn't it be funny if he was there and he saw, that's my submarine gone by. <laughs> Anyway, uh, onward. Uh, this picture is the submarine in Las Cruces, and uh, a contingent of uh, what's now New Mexico State University, the NROTC unit there, escorted the sub downtown. And the city fire department had a neat deal. Every time somebody bought a $1,000 savings bond, they sounded the siren and they sounded it 35 times. Uh, Las Cruces in total, uh, including the area, uh, including Anthony and Masia, raised uh, $100,000, which is pretty good. Um, and by the way, what do you get if you purchase a $10,000 bond? You get a piece of the steel hull, which is the window cutout, the 22 windows. <laughs> and the city of Albuquerque bought one. I wonder where that is. <laughs> this is a classic picture. I really, really like this. This is also in Las Cruces. 33 kids in this. Look at this one right here. He's in some kind of uniform. And, and they're all looking very stern. It's really a neat picture. So that's in Las Cruces. Uh, and speaking of school kids, uh, this is a submarine compared to a school bus. It's about the size. It's 81 feet long, 6 feet in diameter at the widest part right here. <laughs> Weighs 46 to 47 tons. And the top of the conning tower right here, down to the ground where he's standing, is 15.5 feet. And that was important for bridge clearance. So sometimes the submarine had to be rotated. Mm. Okay, it went on to Hatch, and look at Hatch, very small community, raised $4,300. Um, that is pretty good. And then it went to Hot Springs, another $2,200. Um, and then, so th this is a, a picture of a submarine somewhere else. I could find very few photographs of the sub in New Mexico. Two in Las Cruces, one in Albuquerque, and one in Moriarty, mm -hmm. which I'll show you. So, uh, here the submarine visited Socorro and Berlin, and these are one hour stops. It was one hour in, in Tier C, one hour in Hatch, one hour in Berlin. Uh, so it, it was really moving along pretty good. Um, oh, and what do you see when you look inside the submarine? There's two dummies, kind of mannequins, dressed up as Japanese submariners with fierce samurai expressions. And that's what people saw when they looked inside the control room. Uh, the submarine arrived in Albuquerque uh, on uh, January 13th and stayed overnight at Kirtland Air Force Base. Actually, it wasn't. It was an Army base, and it was called Kirtland Field. And uh, so base members were given some special access to take a look at the sub. Here it is, downtown, not far from here. Mm -hmm. January 14th, 20,000 spectators lined Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. At the time, it was the largest parade in uh, the city's history. Mm -hmm. uh, the sub had to be rotated at 45 degrees by a winch on board the tractor trailer rig to get under the Santa Fe o underpass, uh, right there on Central, as it goes down. So the sub went, uh, actually this picture is looking west. It, it cruised from Broadway to 8th Street, uh, right down Central. Look at all those people. And this is such a, a great picture that, and by the way, the, the city did purchase a $10,000 a bond and KLB did a remote broadcast when it parked uh, between 4th and 5th streets. Uh, the city raised 175000 Now, that's such a great picture, I had to blow it up yeah, bigger yeah. so you could see. But uh, some of these buildings are not here anymore, but First National Bank is. Remember, we're looking west, and there's a Walgreens, Western Union, a drugstore. Uh, this is, uh, that's the 
Grand Central Hotel. I, I think it's gone now, right? Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, really neat picture. That's, uh, that's a vacant lot now, right, Diane? Right. No. Is that, it? that is the NTR Miho building, and Janet's right, it's gone. So, this was a, a combination military and civilian parade. Uh, it was headed by uh, City Commission uh, Chairman Clyde Tingley, yeah. and it, it had uh, a front in the parade uh, Kirtland Field Commander Army Colonel Hackett, and also the Mobile Air Training Depot Commander Colonel Fight. The UNM NROTC unit was part of the parade, the 31st Army Air Force Band, American Women's Service, you can read these, American Legion, Drum and Bugle Corps, and various submarine, organ uh, not just submarine, various World War I veteran oh. organizations were also in the parade. So again, this is uh, west on Central between Broadway and uh, 8th Street. And, and the submarine turned around at 8th Street and, and parked between 4th and 5th and opened for the exhibit and that went all afternoon. So how did it get through to Harris Canyon? Remember in 1943 to Harris was a two-lane road with steep curves, uh, sharp curves, steep declines, inclines, uh, but it made it. There's a place called Deadman's Curve there, which was the tightest part on that route back then. <laughs> you can still see Deadman's Curve, but it's been leveled out by all the interstate construction. Uh, so this was Route 66 that went through to Harris. No, no stop there. Through Edgewood, no stop, but it stopped at Moriarty, which at the time was Buford for one hour. And this picture is, it's not good quality, but that is the sub on Route 66 in Buford. <laughs> Again, some of these pictures are from other places in the country, but it shows uh, how the submarine somehow sometimes had to be tilted. Um, so it reached uh, from Route 66 to Highway 80, 285 and then down the Pecos River Valley. It spent the weekend in Roswell, and uh, that's a kind of a, a good place to have a tangible connection to the war and an inspiration to contribute to this war campaign. There were other military installations around Roswell, so they were already military oriented. Roswell raised more than Albuquerque, 213,000. Then it went to Artesia, 93,000. Carlsbad, 77,000. Uh, then it was headed for Pecos and uh, points east, including Washington, D.C., uh, New York City, and Chicago. And at the end of World War II, HA-19 was moored at the pier at Chicago's Navy Pier uh, on Lake Michigan. But that wasn't the end of uh, things for HA-19. It uh, went on to Key West, and it was on display there from 1947 all the way to 1990. And by the way, Japan had hundreds of these submarines. Uh, they only used a few, uh, probably maybe less than 20. Um, we destroyed them a, a, a month after Japanese surrendered. And here's that same dry dock with uh, 84 submarines destroyed, midget submarines. Oh. This happened uh, in October 1945. Okay, next stop, after uh, 1990, it left Key West and it went to Fredericksburg, Texas. And here is the, what's called the Museum of the Pacific War. It's also known as the Nimitz Museum. And it became a permanent visit there and it's still there. Um, Admiral Nimitz, a lot of people don't realize this, but he was first a submariner. And here's what he said about submarines. They're a cross between Jules Verne fantasy and a humpback whale. <laughs> and by the way, there's his gold dolphins. This is the submarine war insignia 
for uh, being qualified in submarines. I had silver because I was enlisted, and I was not a uh, five-star admiral. Like, uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> he outranked me a lot. Um, I should have mentioned this way early. I had a picture of Franklin D. Roosevelt looking at the submarine at Vallejo, California in Mare Isle Naval Shipyard. So he had seen it before it got to Washington. Here it is in front of the nation's capital. So this is what it looked like when it was in Key West. Here's what it looks like today. I've been there and it looks really good. Um, they've uh, covered up all the windows again so it looks like it did when it was pulled out of the Pacific back in uh, uh, December 8th, 1941. Well, the first World War II POW was Sakamaki. He was invited to participate in the Pearl Harbor Symposium in Fredericksburg, where he uh, reviewed, he got to see his old submarine, he, that's what he's doing right here. Uh, this was in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, after the war, he was returned to Japan and he rose through the ranks at Toyota and did very well. He became a vice president of operations. Wow. And uh, he died in November 1999, age 81. I'm a stamp collector, and I, I, I save submarine stamps. I've got about 700 of them. But believe it or not, HA-19 is on this stamp. That You saw these uh, islands in some of my pictures where it was beached. And here's uh, USS Ward. Uh, depth charging uh, HA-19. Uh, it actually uh, claims it sunk two submarines, midget submarines, but uh, we know that HA-19 was not actually sunk. So, uh, what, this what was that Michigan yeah, stamp? Back Could what? you go back and talk about that Michigan stamp? Michigan, it was on the... Oh yeah, it's not a postage stamp, but it's a... a, a in Ann Arbor, Michigan in July, the submarine tour there, and they had this, this is a, awesome. a, a saying that they had during the Second World War, mm -hmm. saw sub sank same, okay, but that's not a real stamp, but I had to put that in there. So, um, this tour through New Mexico raised $700,000, a little more than that, which is in today's dollars about $10 million. It toured through 2,000 U.S. cities, towns, villages, in 41 states. And with an average of raising $22,000 per hour when it was on static display. And in fact, it raised enough money to repair all the ships that were damaged in the Pearl Harbor attack. So there it is. This was I-24 carrying HA-19. It's supposed to be a moonlit. There's Diamond Head, there's Waikiki and Honolulu. And uh, by the way, for more complete information on this, this story, um, if you're a member of the uh, Historical Society of New Mexico, the latest Chronica has a feature story on this submarine. Uh, or if you want a little preview of what we just saw today, um, I think Ollie Reed did an outstanding job writing this in a Sunday paper. It was good. So I am open for any questions, uh, comments. Uh, okay. Uh, submarine service is a silent service, but you don't need. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question over there. I've got a question here. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Japan must have anticipated the war long before it started having built all that hardware. They must have. Uh, all those submarines were built before a Pearl Harbor attack probably, or they were still building them. They were used in Sydney and in the Aleutian Islands and a couple other the Pacific Islands to no great ex uh, success at all. And I think uh, after Pearl Harbor and Sydney did not go well, they probably stopped using them. But look at all the resources they put into hundreds of those midget submarines. And, and they had to have other larger submarines to carry them, yeah, to get them to where they could do some damage. Well, but, and 
Japan began developing the midget submarines in 1931. So it wasn't necessarily the anticipation of Pearl Harbor, but it was certainly a part of their military planning. This is ironic, but our, our submarine force started in 1900 when John P. Holland built some small submarines, even smaller than these midget submarines, and Japan bought the first five. <laughs> That's kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah, we have a question over here. Uh, yes, sir, but uh, I'll get all of you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, weren't there little one-man subs during the Civil War? Uh, yes, there was. Well, not one man, it was eight. And it was manpower. They were all uh, on this crank to turn the screw. It was not successful. That was the Hunley. It was successful in sinking the Housatonic but the Hunley did not return to port. And we, we recovered it probably about 10 years ago. We're still studying it. That was an eight-man submarine, yes. Um, yes, sir? Also, uh, were all the submarines by the Japanese suicide missions? All the midget submarines? Yeah. Yes, uh, they're kind of the forerunner of the kamikaze pilots. Uh, these guys went on, went down that hatch and they knew they probably would not return. In fact, when Sakamaki was captured, he asked to be able to commit suicide because it was a huge dishonor for him to, and, and Yonemoto was furious with him because he not only survived, but he let the submarine be captured. So, the, the reason I think he ran aground is still controversial, but his gyro failed and he couldn't navigate. In fact, these little submarines were really hard to control, and when it separated from I-24, it actually took a nosedive. They couldn't get the trim right. So you can imagine what would happen after you lose two 800-pound torpedoes. The trim's going to be out of balance again. They didn't think they'd make it. Uh, I need to move around. Several people have more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Is it known uh, as to why the other <coughs> occupant of the sub drowned? It? Drowned? It? The other five? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 that was what Sufiati. He's talking about Inagaki. Right. In Inagaki? What happened to him? Yeah. Uh, we've seen two reports. One is that he drowned uh, off the coast of uh, White Manalo. But there's another report that they found him on the shore <coughs> with a bullet hole. So we don't know really what happened to him, but he didn't survive. Um, the other four submarines were not successful. They've recovered, I think, uh, most of them. One of them still had a torpedo. On, actually, all of them had torpedoes, except one had just one. And there's some aerial photos of the Pearl Harbor attack that they think they see a torpedo track in Pearl Harbor, and there's some speculation that it might have hit the Oklahoma, but we don't know that for sure. So that mission was totally unsuccessful. Uh, Joe, back to Joe. Um, you mentioned uh, an attack on Sydney, Australia. Never heard about that. But is that the only other major attempt that the Japanese That is made? the other major attack on a harbor because these subs were designed to sneak into a harbor. There's something I didn't point out here. These are net cutters. Uh, that is, they're built so that the torpedo can still go through. But a lot of harbors had submarine nets going across. Sydney and Pearl Harbor might have. And uh, that would snag the submarine and keep it from getting in. I haven't really studied uh, Sydney very much. Uh, but they had the same kind of submarine uh, sneak in there and do some things, but not successful. Yes, okay, sir. you were so you were doing research trying to find photos of this mini sub, including records that Mayor Ireland, I guess the Navy had. Were there some records or photographs or other things that that Navy had classified during World War II that are declassified now that that you were able to look at to do research on this? I probably could have done some more research and gone to the. Naval History and Historical Center in Navy Yard and check to see if they have declassified pictures. This was probably uh, um, quite a find for the Navy and they did take 
a lot of the equipment out and studied it pretty carefully before it was dismantled and and then put on the freighter and sent to Mare Island. Uh, before it was sent, they surely took the torpedoes off and the demolition charge. And to save weight, they took the motor out and the batteries, those were heavy items. Um, I have done so much searching for photos, and this is all I can come up with. Um, there's a lot of photos in old newspapers, but they're not reproducible. So I wish we, we had more to see, especially on the tour in New Mexico. And, and where are all those photographers back then? They, they should have donated to the Historical Society. Yes, sir. Uh, if any of you have not been to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, uh, it was a fascinating exhibit there of a World War II German submarine that was captured. And you can actually go on a tour through the submarine. And the most interesting aspect of that to me is how cramped and small it was. I mean, this was a full-size submarine in its day, which had several torpedoes in it. And the bunks for some of the crewmen were right above the torpedoes. I mean, it was... If you had claustrophobia, you did not want to be on that submarine. He's talking about the U-505, which was captured in the Atlantic for the Ignima. I can never say that. Say that. You're an intelligence naval Enigma. officer. Enigma. 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 Anyway, the secret coding machine that they communicated they caught that submarine and got that device, which really helped shorten the war in the Atlantic. Um, anybody else? Janet. Well, this is a generic question okay. about qualifications to be accepted into the submarine service. I've been told that there has to be a psychological test to make sure that claustrophobia or other... Uh, uh, so could, could you just comment on that? Uh, Dick, like when you applied, what did, how did they figure out that you were okay to be in a submarine? Well, you do get in a psychological exam. Um, there's several ways they test you for claustrophobia. All this uh, is in submarine school in New London, Connecticut. Um, you learn about submarines, but they also put you in a big tank to make sure that you uh, can get to the surface from 50 feet below. Uh, I did it twice, uh, one time from 100 feet below, um, and that you got That's part of your qualifications. You got to learn how to escape from a sunken submarine. Uh, Today, submarines they go so deep you could never escape. But, uh, so there is psychological and, and physical uh, uh, qualifications before you go on a submarine. Yeah. Does a person have to be like shorter than a certain uh, size or or Way. Uh, no, um, huh. no physical limit on that, probably on weight, but not height. But all those tall guys have uh, a lot of bumps on their forehead. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can easily, submarine is all steel, and you hit anything, it's going to hurt. Roland. Well, you mentioned it, but I'm not sure everybody really understood that. Now, these guys were quite slight. And remember, they had to climb up on the outside of that submarine, just like this painting oh. shows, to get into the hatch that was at the top of the conning tower. Uh, so they had to go out and then climb up this ladder, get into the conning tower, and then make it through a 16-inch diameter porthole. Take, take a 16-inch hoop and try to put it around most American bodies, certainly not mine, no. and you're not going to make it. <laughs> These guys were very thin. So once they're inside, this submarine submerged, and they detach while they're submerged. If they ever did survive, this submarine was uh, ordered to go park off Lanai, and that was going to be the rendezvous if these midget submarines made it. They were all supposed to try to get back to Lanai and, and get hooked up to their mothership, but that didn't happen. Yes, ma'am. The other five, did they all die? Or the clip crews all died in in the attack, or did they survive? No, none of them survived. Uh, so we had 
10 crewmen, one survived, and that was Sakamaki. Uh, the others uh, died in the submarine. Um, and I think we've found most of the wreckage now, and those bodies are still on board. Uh, some of the submarines we found, we pulled them out to deeper water and let them sink. Uh, so it's a, a sacred thing. That, that, that's a, a burial site for these Japanese submariners. Nobody made it. Was the bullhead a submarine that, that the park is named after? The, USS? the, the bullhead is an American submarine SS-332. It was the last submarine that we lost in the Second World War and it was lost on August 6, 1945, the very day that we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. Kind of ironic. Uh, all those guys were, were lost. It was bombed from the air, two direct hits um, near the Lombok Strait. Um, mm -hmm. so that, and That's right. the, the U.S. Submarine Veterans Organization, we lost 52 submarines in the Second World War, and they were distributed to each state. Oh. California and New York got two, but the other uh, states got one. And it's kind of ironic that we ended up with a bullhead lost when the bomb was dropped, the very bomb that was developed right here. Oh. Yeah. All kinds of ironies going on here. Yes, ma'am. Today's Navy, what percentage um, is the summer year? What's that? Section? In today's Navy, what percentage of the entire Navy is dedicated to submarines? Oh, probably uh, less than 10%. Yeah. Really? Um, submariners are kind of special. They used to tell us that we, either, we were the elite of the fleet. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, our submarine force is much smaller than it was during World War II. Uh, 